This is lecture seven of social psychology. In this lecture, we'll be talking about attitudes. And uh, in the first part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the nature of attitudes. So what are attitudes? Uh, let me illustrate this by, by showing you some pictures. Here you see an iPhone. This is Coriander. Well, this guy, I think you, are all, you all know him, Vladimir Putin. And these are very famous French fries. So my guess is that at least with one of these pictures, or maybe even with all of these pictures, you immediately have this sense of like or dislike. You immediately know what, how you feel about it. Whether you like the iPhone, yes or no. Whether you like the taste of coriander, yes or no. Well, our feelings about this guy uh, here in the picture are, I think, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, whether you like going to uh, McDonald's uh, or not. So these are all objects, objects that we can feel a certain way towards. And the way we feel towards these objects are called attitudes. So attitudes are basically our general evaluation of an attitude object. And an attitude object can be anything. It can be a person, it can be um, an object, it can be an idea or even a theory. So you can also have an attitude towards social psychology, towards the lectures that I'm giving. Maybe you like them, maybe you don't like them. So you can have an attitude towards them. And uh, attitudes is actually a topic that we've been discussing in previous lectures, but I never really explicitly mentioned the word attitude. So we discussed attitudes in the previous lecture when we talked about cognitive dissonance. So if we have a certain attitude towards, for example, climate change and our behavior is not in line with that, then we experience the feeling of dissonance. So, um, and also we talked about the self, right? We talked about how we feel about ourselves, our general evaluation of ourself, which is captured in our self-esteem. And our self-esteem is actually also an attitude. It's the attitude we have towards us, towards the, the person you see when you look in the mirror. So uh, attitudes uh, are studied a lot and, um, and they are studied because uh, we as psychologists, but also as lay people, we have an idea that our attitudes are a strong predictor of our behavior. So if we know how people feel about something, we also know how they will behave. And this is a topic that we'll uh, be talking a lot about in this lecture. Uh, but first, uh, let me dive into uh, the theory of attitudes a little bit more. So our attitudes are a general evaluation, but they consist of several parts. Uh, there's a part of cognition, and the cognitive part of an attitude basically means what knowledge do you have about it? How much do you know about something? But we also have feelings, so we also have an affective response, and that is, do you feel positive or negative about it? And finally, we also have behavior. So do you tend to approach this object or person, or do you tend to avoid it? So these are the three different components, uh, as you wish, of attitudes. And it's also important to know that for some attitudes, they are more cognitively based. So for example, a certain type of vacuum cleaner. You may not have very strong feelings towards your vacuum cleaner, but you know if, when you buy one, you know something about it. So you can uh, start looking up information and read reviews on a vacuum cleaner. But this is a vacuum cleaner is pr pretty much a uh, cognitive based. So it's a cognitive uh, based uh, condition. But some topics are more affect based. They give you very strong feelings, strong feelings of like or dislike. And that's probably for uh, the pictures I showed you uh, earlier on, probably immediately have this sense of, oh, I like this, or I don't like it, or I hate it even. So some topics are more affect-based. And if it's more affect-based, it often has to do something with our morals. So for example, if we see Vladimir Putin, we may have a very strong feeling of dislike, maybe even hate, because we really dis dissent, you know, we feel like what he's doing um, uh, or, and how he's treating people and how he's treating his own uh, people in Russia and uh, people from Ukraine, we have very strong uh, feelings about that. So this is a more an affect-based uh, cognition. And then finally, uh, some attitudes are more behavioral based. We don't really think about it, we just do it. For example, hiking. You might be hiking quite a lot, uh, and this is behavior you show. Maybe you don't really think about doing this, it's just something you do. So this is more a behaviorally uh, based attitude. But all attitudes consist of these three different uh, components. A question that you may have is where do these attitudes come from? Well, there's actually several different sources of our attitudes and I will uh, discuss uh, them with you now. So first of all, genetics. That's an interesting first, uh, uh, first component of where our attitudes come from. So there's some evidence that 
that uh, how we feel about some things, our attitudes, uh, are partly genetic. And this has been shown, for example, in research uh, with identical twins that don't grow up together, so they, they, they live in separate houses, they don't interact, but they still um, have uh, some sort of similarity in the things they like and dislike. So uh, these two girls, well, they know each other uh, clearly, but if they w won't, wouldn't be able to grow up together, they grow up in different households, maybe they both would have the same hobby when they grow up. And this is, of course, also because they share temperament, they share parts of their personality because they're identical twins. Um, and your personality is also a predictor of your uh, attitudes. So, for example, if you are a very uh, enthusiastic person, you're very uh, extroverted, then you might also really like to go out and you have a very positive attitude towards going out and visiting bars. Uh, well, if you're more introverted, you may dislike this. So uh, part of how, what our attitudes are is captured in our genes. Uh, but secondly, uh, maybe even more importantly, uh, social learning. So we talked uh, in the very first lecture about what social learning is. Social learning is the many ways in which we learn about ourselves and, uh, and the world around us uh, through our role models. And um, uh, mostly our parents are very stro uh, strong role models uh, for us. And uh, the attitudes that your parents have, they pass it on to you. That's really likely. So if your parents are, for example, religious and you have a very strong attitudes towards, uh, positive attitudes towards going to church, there's quite a high likelihood that you will also grow up to be a religious person yourself. Or, uh, and you see this uh, here very clearly, so if your parents are, for example, farmers and if it feel a very strong way about certain uh, decisions made uh, by politicians, then they also pass this on to their children, uh, be basically uh, putting their attitudes up on their children. So we learn our own attitudes from uh, watching our, our role models and our role models are instructing us about their own attitudes. But it's also more subtle. So it's not only if your parents tell you to go to church, for example, that you develop an attitude uh, towards going to church, but it's also by watching your parents. And this is also called modeling. So for example, if you have a mother that is really fond of yoga and does these yoga exercises every day, even if she's not putting it on you, so even if she's not stimulating you to do yoga, just by watching her, there's quite a high likelihood that you will also end up uh, being enthusiastic about doing yoga yourself because we learn through imitation. We watch our caregivers and we do what they do. We copy them. That's basically how our children are raised, more so than by the explicit instructions we give them, it's more by showing them behavior that they will later on copy. So genetic social learning, but there's also, that's, this is all basically captured in either your genes or, or what your parents put on you, but also your own experience, apart from your parents, also have an impact on your attitude. So your own behavior, for example. This is uh, something we uh, discussed in lecture five when we talked about self-perception theory, you remember? So if we are uncertain about what we feel about something, we can look at our own behavior and then estimate how we feel about something. So this is primarily the case for more behaviorally based attitudes. So if someone asks you, how do you feel about hiking? You think about the times that you went out and went hiking and you think, oh, I really enjoyed being in nature and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and I guess I do it quite often. Yes, I like hiking. So our own behavior gives us information about our attitudes, something we saw before. Um, but also our experiences w when interacting with, with uh, certain attitude objects can give us, can sort of form and shape our, uh, our attitudes. And this can happen in multiple ways. First of all, through classical conditioning. And uh, with classical conditioning, we refer to uh, if something happens, something uh, that is in itself neutral, uh, but it's paired with an emotional response, then after a while, you can start to develop an attitude towards this neutral uh, stimulus as well. So let me illustrate this, this with, with an example. If you go to the dentist, there's oftentimes this very specific smell. It smells really clean, but also like maybe a, a bit artificial, but there's a very pronounced smell when you go to the dentist. I think you can all you know, remember this, this smell, right? The smell in and of itself is maybe not really bad. It can be you know, interpreted as a neutral smell in the beginning. But after a while, you start uh, linking this, this smell 
the smell of, of cleaning products, dental cleaning products, with the uh, treatments that you get while you are at the dentist. And sometimes the tr these treatments are, of course, not pleasurable at all. Oftentimes, they are even hur hurting you. And after a while, just smelling this very specific dental product smell can immediately give you this, this negative feeling because of the experience of classical conditioning. So the neutral stimulus, the smell of the dentist, is sort of combined uh, with uh, the experience of going to the dentist. And after a while, you start hating the smell, even if you don't have to go to the dentist yourself. So this is learning through classical conditioning. The second way of learning is through operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is if you perform a certain behavior, which is later either rewarded or punished then you learn that some behavior is behavior that is positive and that you should show, and other behavior is behavior that is negative. So there's some sort of reinforcement later by a third party, oftentimes, again, your parents or your teachers, that, for example, reward you or punish you while you show certain behavior. And so, for example, for this kid, he knows that if he um, goes uh, to visit his family all day, which is maybe sometimes a bit boring for him, but then he comes home and he gets this, this delicious lollipop because he's been such a good boy. So this is rewarding a kid for showing certain behavior, then he will develop a more positive attitude towards this behavior. So we learn through classical conditioning and operant conditioning, but there's a third way this, that is actually not in the book chapter, but I think it's important for you to know, and that is that we also learn through mere exposure. Merely being exposed to a certain attitude object changes our attitudes. And I will show you this by, the, uh, by explaining the following uh, study that has been done on the mere exposure effect. In this study, participants came into the lab, they pl were placed behind a computer screen, and they were watching neutral objects that are displayed in the screen. These objects didn't mean anything for them. These were either, for example, Chinese characters, and these, these uh, participants were not Chinese, so they couldn't read these characters, or maybe Turkish words. Um, so some things that, that were meaningless to them. And some of the words or characters were displayed uh, many times, and others were displayed just once or twice. So the frequency with which these objects were displayed differed. Some were displayed a lot and others not. And then at the very end of the study, each of these objects were shown on the screen one by one. And participants were asked to rate uh, what they felt about the object. And again, all these objects looked pretty much the same. They were really neutral, so maybe you wouldn't expect there to be any difference at all. But there was a difference, and what this research showed was for the objects that were shown many times, they were rated more positively than the objects that were rated, uh, that were uh, showed less uh, frequently. So the more we see something, the more we start liking it. And this is what the mere exposure effect uh, means. It means that we are liking for something increases to the extent that we have seen it more often. And this is also something we can experience in, in daily life. For example, um, let's take me. I am a huge Beyonce fan. And she just, uh, when she drops a new al album every time I listen to it, and the very first time I listen to the album, I'm oftentimes not super excited to begin with. I'm like, I listen to the album, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is okay, I like this song, maybe not really like this song. And then I repeat it because I'm a fan, so I just continue listening to the album. And after a few times, I'm like, yeah, I really like this. I like it more. And then after repeating it over and over again, I'm like, this is my favorite album. This is the best album she ever uh, you know, brought out. So the more often you listen to a song, the more you start liking it. And I think this is also something that we can um, recognize ourselves. When you hear a song on the radio for the first time, then you may not have very strong feelings towards it. But if, you, if it's repeated, then you start liking it more and more, up to a certain point. Up to a certain point, because if it's too much, like I have with this wonderful song, Happy, by Pharrell Williams, I really like the song but not anymore. It's been too much. So and this is called overexposure. So in the beginning, there's sort of a steep line uh, that we start liking something more. Up to a certain point, if it's overexposed, then we start liking it less again. Something to keep in mind, by the way, for the, uh, the mere exposure effect, it only works if uh, it's either the object is neutral 
or it is already a little bit positive to begin with. So, for example, with the Chinese characters or the Turkish words, they were completely neutral. You didn't feel any way about it. You don't know what they mean. For the Beyoncé album, I'm already a little bit positive because I'm a Beyoncé fan. But if you immediately dislike something, the mere exposure effect doesn't work. Okay, so if you immediately hate a song, repeating it probably won't really uh, help you liking it more. Okay, so the, these are the three different ways in which we learn through experience. And now we know we have a sense of how our attitudes are developed. But now we want to measure them. And as psychologists, as scientists, we, of course, are very interested in measuring people's attitudes. And we can do so in multiple ways. First of all, we can measure explicit attitudes through questionnaires. And let me first explain to you what an explicit uh, attitude is. An explicit attitude uh, means uh, an attitude that we consciously endorse and can easily report. So something that I'm very uh, uh, articulated on, I know how I feel about it, I can explain it, and I can also report it. So if I want to know how a person feels about something, I can simply ask them. Straightforward, right? So for example, I could ask you to agree or disagree with the following statement. I think Mark Rutte is a good prime minister. Then you can either strongly disagree, you can say undecided, I don't know, or you can strongly agree. So you can report your explicit attitude on a questionnaire like this. But interestingly, we don't only have explicit attitudes, we also have implicit attitudes. And implicit attitudes are attitudes that exist pretty much outside of awareness. We don't really know it, we feel it in our body, but we don't really, we don't, we cannot consciously report this. And we'll be talking more about implicit attitudes later, but for now, just keep in mind that you have to measure them differently. So implicit attitudes cannot be measured through questionnaires because they are not conscious. They are subconscious. This is sort of a general, more affect-based experience. And we can measure them, for example, by using physiological measures, uh, like measuring skin conductance. And what you can do then, for example, if I want to know some, someone's implicit attitudes about spiders, what I can then do is then hook them up on uh, this skin conductance measurement, and I can show them spiders. And I can see how their body responds. So if a person really dislikes spiders and have this tendency to avoid spiders or have spider phobia, then we, can, we know that their palms will get more sweaty. And this is an indication of having a strong attitude, implicit attitudes towards something, an attitude of dislike in this uh, case. So we can use physiological measures or we can use an implicit association test. And this is something I'll come back to in lecture 13. But just keep in mind that this is a way of measuring implicit attitudes. So um, when we talk about attitudes, it's important to keep in mind that not all attitudes are as important to us. So this depends on how accessible this attitude is. And this is, uh, again, something we talked about before. For some topics or some you know, uh, attitude objects are not so important to you. So you don't feel a very strong way about it. Other topics we have very strong feelings about. And researchers are also often interested in knowing how uh, accessible a certain attitude is, so how strongly people feel about it. Um, so, for example, if I want to know uh, how strongly people feel about our prime minister over here, then you can say, Mark Rutte is a good prime minister. And then you can, you know, you, you're interested in the answer, but you're also interested in how quickly people respond. So, um, you see this in the screen, you have to respond as quickly as possible by saying yes or no. So, you measure the reaction times, and we know if a person says, for example, yes, and half a second, that's an indication for a stronger attitude than if a person says yes in, let's say, two seconds. So this, the faster a person responds, the stronger this person feels about uh, a certain attitude object, in this case, uh, Mark Rutte. So, and of course, the idea is if we have a stronger a feeling about something or someone, this will be a better indication of our behavior. And this is also the case. So for the people that really feel very strongly about Mark Rutte, uh, have a very strong association, uh, that will probably influence their voting behavior. And if we have a weaker attitude, uh, then our uh, attitude is oftentimes not a very good predictor of our behavior. Um, so in the next part of this lecture, we'll be talking more about the complicated relationship between our attitudes and our behavior. That's it for now.